Good morning. It's good to see everybody. Well, almost. Yeah. You're, you're here today for a reason. Are you expecting visitors or some great things to happen today? You know, you know, if we request and we're in the right frame of mind, God might stop by here or send his Holy Spirit here this morning, which would be a good thing, right? Good to see everybody anyway. Okay, welcome. I don't see any first-time visitors, okay? Um, but you're all welcome anyway, okay? So uh, this morning we're going to have our scripture reading and prayer by Mr. I won't say Alfred, but you know. Yeah. When you're, you're ready. <laughs> Good morning. How's everybody this wonderful Sunday morning? I'm going to be reading a little scripture here today we're all familiar with, and it's about the woman at the well, and Jesus going and talking to her and all that. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing. It's like 30-something verses here. But I'm going to hit on the top ones, and we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah, so everyone stand. And I'm going to start with verse 10, it's in chapter 4. And it says, Jesus answered her, and, and she had talked to him, and he had asked her for water. And, and of course, by her being a Samaritan, she was uh, she kind of shocked her that a Jew would ask her for something. But anyway, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked, and he would have given you living water. Well, she went on and told him that, you know, that he didn't have anything to draw water with. And I mean, she was looking at it from the from the the flesh side and not from the spiritual side. But then Jesus came back in verse 13 and says, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a living spring of water, welling up to eternal life. So she said, let me, I would like to have some of this water. Well, he told her, said, well, you need to go get your husband. Well, she fessed up and said, well, of course, I don't have a husband. And Jesus came back in verse 17 and says, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. And then a the woman went back and told him, said, Sir, I can tell that you're a prophet, but we, the Jews worship in Jerusalem and that they were in Samaria and she wasn't able to worship. She didn't feel like she was able to worship God that way. But Jesus declared to her in verse 21, Believe me, woman, a time is coming for when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans will worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and it has now come, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and truth, and they are in the kind and the worships the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worship must worship in spirit and in truth. And then she went on to say that, that she knows that the Messiah is called Christ. And when he comes, that he'll explain everything. But Jesus went back and said to her in verse 26, Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Pretty plain. You know, I, I get a few things from this part that I've listened to. One of the, one of the four things that I come out with is that you know, we need to interact with other people even though they're different. That's what Jesus is telling us. She was different. She was half Jew, half Gentile. And we're supposed to have talked about how Christ excites us because our words have power. And doing the will of God will fulfill us. Let us pray. Thank you for this beautiful day. And thank you for our families. We praise you, O oh Lord. Among all that we have, there are so many hurting and needy people. We lift them up to you and ask you if you would bless them, help them, and heal them. May your peace fill their hearts and fill them with joy. 
We ask you to fulfill their needs according to your will. We also pray that you would use us to help them in any way that we can. Open our eyes and make us aware of the opportunities that we have to bless others in need. Help us not to be selfish. Help us to share. All that we have is yours, and we surrender to you. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Remember, Jesus didn't go to that well to get a drink of water. He went there for a person who was lost. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Please stand for the reading of God's word. You know, the cross is something the world doesn't want to hear about today. Satan hates the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross is the defining point. The cross is what paid the price for our sins. Because of the cross, we have hope for tomorrow. Because of the cross, we have confidence in the future. And this is going to sound like a sermon that you've heard your whole life, but I'm going to tell you the good news of the Bible is this. Jesus came, he died, and he rose again. That's the good news of the cross and the resurrection. Look with me in Luke 23rd chapter, 32nd verse. There are also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to this place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and one on the left. <clears throat> then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and they cast lots, just as was prophesied, y'all. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour. And then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Help us to never forget the good news of the cross. Help us, God, to see what Jesus did on that cross was the only way that our sins could be paid for. What Jesus did on that cross demonstrated the love that the Father has for us. And God, help us to realize today that everybody needs to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And God, let us have a desire to go out of these doors today into our own mission field and to proclaim the name of Christ. Now, Lord, I pray that your spirit would walk up and down the aisles in the little church by the road today, that your spirit would be so strong, dear Heavenly Father, going out on the internet, that lives would be changed and souls would be saved and people's feet would be put back on the right track. Now, Lord, clean me up, make me a clean vessel. God, let your words flow through me. And all of God's people today said a very loud, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There are many ways that one might meet your demise it might be an accident it might be a disease it might be old age it might even be through intent of your own or through someone else's but it made me think of a story that I had heard that's kind of humorous and said a man was laying on his deathbed dying and he started contemplating his life and everything that had happened and he turned over to his wife and he said honey you've always been there for me you were there when I lost my job. You were there when I was involved in that terrible accident. You were right by my side. That time I fell off the roof and broke both arms and both legs, you were there to call the ambulance. During those years of dark depression that I 
that I fought, you stood by me. And now as I lay here on death's door, you're right beside me, just like always. And the man stopped for a second and he rubbed his chin and he looked at his wife and he said, Gladys, I believe you're just bad luck. <laughs> but there's many ways that you can meet your death today. But there's only two outcomes when you die. Either you're going to die with Christ or without Christ. There's no other way. There's no place called purgatory. There's no place in intermediary area where somebody can pay your way into heaven. Either you are going to die with Jesus Christ and your sins forgiven, or you are going to die without Jesus Christ and headed to a devil's hell. I did not say that. God's Word says that. I want to tell you a story about three brothers. Three brothers. They all had grown up in a great house. They had everything that a, that a family could want at that time. Though they were not rich, but they came from a good home. They were loved by their parents. And two of the three brothers had a different spirit. The elder brother was calm and relaxed, loved the Lord with all his heart. The two younger brothers... They grew up into their teens and they became involved in fights and parties and immorality and, and the wrong crowd, we might say. In a real sense, the elder brother tried to calm his two younger brothers down and he kind of represented Jesus Christ to them because he offered them a better way and yet he was made fun of. He was met with scorn just like Jesus Christ and he was ridiculed. And his pleas for his two younger brothers fell on deaf ears. Well, in time, there was an attempted robbery. And the elder brother, let's just call him Bill, his younger brother, Ted, was shot and killed. He had not listened to his elder brother. He had not listened to the pleas of his parents or of the church. He was shot and he killed and killed, and he died without knowing Jesus Christ. Well, today I want to talk to us about three men, three crosses, and three deaths. The first man I want to talk to you about today, we read about him in verse 39. The first man died in sin, and it said this, Then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. This thief in a bad condition, he's hanging on the cross, he's about to die, and yet he joined the other mockers. He joined the other people who were making fun of Jesus Christ. And let me remind you that there are people today who make fun of Jesus Christ. They make fun of us for believing in what he did. And yet in that crowd at the foot of the cross where Jesus was hanging, there were people who had seen him perform miracles, and yet they're making fun of him. They're mocking him. They're saying, if you are the Christ, then save yourself. And yet, the crowd is just like us today. We're having, we're having. This criminal was hanging on this cross and he looked at Christ and he said, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us. Listen, he was not worried about Jesus. He was not worried about the other criminal. He was worried about saving his self. And today we are the same. We care about ourselves. We don't care about our neighbor who is dying and going to hell. And here's what the world says today. Just like the people at the foot of the cross, nobody tells me what to do. I'm the captain of my own ship. I make my own choices. I call my own shots. I'm a man amongst men. I will do my whatever I think is right. And their philosophy is this. If it feels good, do it. Or they say in their heart, well, if the crowd is doing it, then it must be okay. Or they say this, I don't want to look out of place. I'm going to go along with the crowd. Their God is their body, their money, their popularity, and their pleasure. And you know what? Paul described this kind of life in Ephesians 2. And here's what he said. And he said, You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Did you hear that? 
Paul said, you're just like the world. You were just like the world. You were acting like them. You were being led astray by the power of the principalities of this world. You were working and doing everything that the world said. And today, some people think that we're good enough to get into heaven by our own right. And we don't need any help from Jesus. They trust in their works. They trust in their security in the bank. They trust in that water to save them. Listen, the only way you can ever be saved is through the blood of Jesus Christ and it is not a decision you make it is a call of the Holy Spirit and your choice is either say yes or no you do not decide to get saved today you get saved today when the Holy Spirit calls you and convicts you to all who think and live that you don't need Jesus listen to what John said in John 8 24 I said therefore to you that you shall die in your sins for unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. Wow, that's pretty plain, isn't it? Don't tell me the Bible's not plain. Don't tell me you can't understand the Bible. Brother Ricky just stood up here and said, Jesus told the woman, I'm Him. I'm it. I am the one you are looking for. And listen, that woman was changed not because she decided to change. That woman was changed because she had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And she went flying back into the town, not ashamed of who she was, but she was proud of who she had become. Amen? Listen to what it says in Luke 13. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And I'm going to tell you, we, I think we're living in the end times, but I don't know that. I just see the Bible being fulfilled. And it doesn't matter if Jesus comes back today or next week or a thousand years. What does the book of Hebrews 9.27, it says it's appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. You will stand before God and you will give an account for the deeds of this flesh, whether they be good or whether they be bad. And you're going to hear one of two things, enter in thy good and faithful or depart from me, I never knew you. So it doesn't matter when he's coming back, it matters are you ready today. Bill's brother Ted died in his criminal condition. He was like this first thief on the cross. He died in sin. And I want to tell you, there is no lawyer after that. There is no appeal after that. If you die without Jesus, that is it. I'm sorry. Well, that don't seem fair. Listen, this has nothing to do with being fair. Because God sent His Son down to die in your place and my place. He did not deserve to die. You and I deserve to die. You and I deserve to go to hell. I don't want to hurt your feelings or shock you, but every one of us in here have sinned against God Almighty. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we would never, ever reach heaven. Bill's brother Ted died. Bill grieved over his slain brother, and, and his grief kind of fueled a fire inside him. And, and for his remaining brother his remaining brother was now in jail for doing something he broke broke the law for and so Bill visited let's just call him Jimmy and he urged him all the more earnestly and he would talk to him about their brother who had died and 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 Jimmy was finally released on bail and the death of his brother and the encouragement of his living brother and let's not forget this the power of the Holy Spirit touched him touched him and he resolved with the help of the Holy Spirit and and with Bill's guidance and help to to change his life he he met Jesus Christ there was a change in his life now listen when you meet Jesus you're not going to be perfect the world is looking for perfect Christians there are none but there's a but right there but through his grace and through His mercy and through His Spirit, I can walk above the storms. And so he decided that he wanted more of Christ because Christ had saved his soul. He was going to return to church, which he did, the church that he grew up in. And he was going to reestablish the ties with his family. And he would severe us. Uh, cut every tie that he had with all the criminal uh, friends out there. 
and he would follow Jesus Christ and he would be an example. And you know what? That brings me to the second man on the second cross. This brings me to the second man who died not in sin, but to sin. Look what it says in verse 40 and 42. And the other answered him, rebuking him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then this man looked with all of the agony in his body. He looked at Christ and he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Your kingdom. Not long before this, this man had been cursing Jesus too. The Bible tells us that he was, he was hurling inserts, insults at Christ. And yet something happened. What happened? He listened to the call of the Spirit upon him. And he saw something different. The Spirit touched him. He realized that he was dying. And death's cold hand was right there. And he did something amazing. He repented. Well, how do you know that preacher? <laughs> what did he say? Listen, there's a lot of ways to repent without coming to an altar. I'm sorry, but, but that's just the way it is. You can repent out on the fishing bank, but you'll be changed. You can repent driving down the road, but you'll be changed. Paul said this. He said, the things I once loved, I now hate. And the things I once hated, I now love. You will be changed. Don't tell me that you repented and nothing changed. All you did was feel sorry for yourself. That's hard preaching, but it's true. This man repented. He realized who he was. He re How do you know that? He said, Lord, remember me. Amen. We have people come to church on Sunday and cry out, Lord, and they don't know him as Lord. They're just mimicking what they've heard. He said, Lord, remember me. And he died to his sins. And Paul reminds all of us who have been birthed into Christ that we have died to our sins as well. Listen to this and see if this sounds like you. Romans 6 and 1. For what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Somebody had asked Paul, said, well, if what you say is true, then I'm just going to go out there and sin, 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 so grace will take care of it. Paul said, no. Why? Because you've been changed to sin. We're going to get to that in a minute. But by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? A dead person can't live in this world. Do you know that? He has no cognizance of what's going on in this world. He's dead. If you are dead to sin, you cannot live in sin. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? And listen, y'all, that's not talking about water baptism. It's talking about being converted. About that spirit filling your heart right then and there. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. We're dead to sin, but we have a new life. We're different. Listen, don't tell me you got saved and you signed a card and you got dunked and you went out and did the same thing you did Friday night. That is not being changed. People will see a difference in you. It means that the Spirit has changed our way of thinking. And some of this is sanctification, and I understand that. Because our little pet sins, sometimes it takes God a little time to work those out of us, okay? But once you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit in you, and He will convict you when you do something wrong. And conviction, my friend, is a blessing from God, not a curse from God. Conviction is God demonstrating His love to us, not trying to make our life miserable. The Bible says that God chastens those whom He loves. Amen? My mama loved me because she didn't mind chastening me, Connie. She'd tear me up. But you know what? It kept me out of jail. Kept me out of bars. Kept me out of places I shouldn't go. And by that today, I can stand here and say, thank you, Mom, I know you love me. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Listen to what Paul said in Colossians 3. 
Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. What are you talking about? Your hands, your feet, your eyes, your ears, your thoughts. Listen, y'all. He says, consider the members of your earthly body dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. He Paul covered every sin that could ever happen right there in those five things. Did you know that? For it is on account of these things that the wrath of God will come, and in them you once also walked. You were lost. You, you did those things. Don't sit there and act like you didn't, because you did. <clears throat> when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices. Now, how many will be honest and say your mouth has got you in trouble before? Hey, come on, Butch, I know it has. Come on now. Okay, 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 come on. <laughs> My mouth got me a whipping when I was 19 by my mama. But that's okay. If she could do it again today, Dale, I'd let her do it, you know. But let me tell you what this means. What Paul, let, me, let me just put this in plain English. It means that once we're saved, we will hate sin instead of loving it. Amen? It means that we will exterminate sin instead of excusing it. Amen. What do you do when you exterminate a bug? You squash him. You don't excuse, well, he's just a bug. He don't know no better. There he goes. Nope, he squash him. It means that we deplore or hate sin instead of defending it. Amen. Think about that. It means that we reject sin instead of rationalizing it. Amen. Well, my daddy drank, so I drank. I've done this my whole life, so it's okay. Here's another one. Well, God made me this way. See, we rationalize it. It means that we incapacitate sin instead of indulging it. What does that mean? Indulging it means we run to that chocolate cake for the third slice. <laughs> does it not? It means that if we're flipping TV channels and there's something we shouldn't see, we stop right there and linger for a second. It means that we crucify sin instead of coddling it, saying, It's okay. It's okay. I've, I've, seen, I've seen mothers and dads do this when God is dealing with their children and God, God has broken their heart and the children are at the altar weeping to, with God. Their, their heart is broken. I've seen mom and dads come running down the aisle and put their arm around. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Let God deal with them because it's not okay. Yes, we love our kids. But I saw something this week that made me stop and think, what's the worst thing than going to hell? The worst thing going to hell is as you're falling into that pit, your children fall faster than you do and they look at you and say, why didn't you tell me? Whew, and that gives me cold chills. Our gratitude, or I mean our attitude, ought to be expressed to God like our brother David. Listen to what he said in Psalms 19. He said, also, Lord, keep back me, thy servant, from presumptuous sins. What does that mean? Prideful sins. Sins that I don't need to do. Lord, you, you can stop me, God. Let them not rule over me. What's he talking about? He's not talking about people. He's talking about don't let those sins rule over me. When you sin, that sin gets control of you. Did you know that? You tell one lie, you tell another lie. You tell another lie. You tell another lie. You have one uh, night with a man or woman you're not supposed to, you want another one, do you not? You get this much, you want more. This happens, I want more. This happens, I want more. David says, do not let sin rule over me, but make me blameless that I shall be acquitted of the transgression. When's the last time you said, God, make me blameless? Psalm 51 says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. What does that mean? When God breaks your heart, that is a blessing from God. 
How does that work? It works because He breaks our heart according to the Old Testament so He can pour His Word into it. And a broken heart and a contrite spirit will lead you to Jesus Christ. Why do you think He knocked Paul down? See, what people don't know is Paul was haughty and prideful walking to Damascus. Do you know that? He was a man amongst men. Look at me. I got papers. I'm going to kill them all, buddy. And from the time God thumped him on the head till he hit his knees, you know what happened? He got a broken heart and a contrite spirit. How do I know that? Because he said, Lord, who are you? Big thing happened from here to here, y'all. God can save you that quick. That's what happened. So if you're dead to sin, you won't be living in it anymore. It won't rule you. And you will have a broken and contrite heart when you sin. When you sin, it ought to break your heart. Your life will have been changed. And just as Jimmy woke up to the air of his ways and decided to turn away from crime and to Christ, sometimes his crooks, friends, didn't want to let him go. He knew too much. They sent two, two friends to Bill's house because Jimmy was living with him. And they came in and they were both sitting there and they looked at him and they said, either, either you join us now or we're going to kill you. They gave him a choice of coming back or being shot. And as he refused, both men squeezed the triggers at the same time. Bill jumped in front of Jimmy, taking one of the slugs in his chest. The other slug hit Jimmy. The thieves and crooks ran off believing they had killed both of them. But Jimmy survived and Bill had given his life to save his brother. And the story goes on to say that Jimmy became an evangelist and led thousands of people to the Lord. Amen. That brings me to the third man. It brings me to the third man. The first man died in sin. The second man died to sin. And the third man died for your sin. Amen. See, I think we forget what Jesus did on that cross. I think we, take, we just take it for granted. It says in Luke 23 and 34, Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And they divided His garments and cast lots. And then in verse 46, And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, He said, Father, unto your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, He believed, breathed His last. Listen, y'all, I want to tell you this. Jesus died for your sins and my sins. Jesus was not a victim of circumstances. Jesus knew why He was here and He knew where He was headed. He was headed to that cross. He was a partner with his father to forgive us of our sins listen to what it says in john 10 for this reason the father loves me because i lay down my life i lay down my life that i may take it again no one has taken it away from me but i lay it down on my own initiative i have authority to lay it down and i have authority to take it up again this commandment i received from my Father. Jesus knew what He was doing, y'all. So how, how does that affect us? How does that bear upon my life? What kind of changes do, will, will that affect in my life? Well, let's see once again what the Bible says. Isaiah 53 and 6, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of all of us to fall on Him. Isn't that amazing? 2 Corinthians 5, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He took our sin so God can flow his righteousness into us so we can be the bright light like Jesus was at the well with the woman. All he did was tell her the truth. Showed her something different. 2 Corinthians 8, <clears throat> For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that, your thought, <clears throat> that you thought his poverty might become rich. What does that mean? Jesus left everything for
for us. Everything. And one more. 1 Peter 2. And He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by His stripes we are healed. How can people misunderstand the Bible? It's so plain. God allowed Jesus to go to the cross on our behalf. So Jesus died for our sins to pay a price that we could not pay. So here's the question. Will you be like the first man and die in your sin? Or will you be like the second man and die to sin? That's the question. Only you can answer it because the Holy Spirit will convict you. And only you can respond yes or no. And I'm going to tell you this, the only person that Christ cannot save is the one that rejects the call of the Holy Spirit. Because He calls everybody. And listen, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow. He may not call you tomorrow. Do you know that? Not next week. Not next year. You may not be here next year. We don't know. So today is the day of, of salvation. Listen to what it says. I say therefore to you that you shall die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am He, you shall die in your sins. And then Paul says again in Romans 6, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin? So are you going to continue in sin today knowing that Jesus died for your sins? And I got one more and I'm through. And this ought to make a Baptist smile. Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ in order that in the ages to come He might show the surpassing riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. Amen. What does that say? God loves you more than you realize. And I'm going to tell you this, church. God loves the alcoholic down the road. He loves the hooker that we read about in the song a while ago. He loves the people that we hate. Hello. The Samaritan woman and Ricky, Ricky that just ties in perfect. The Samaritan woman was hated by everybody in town. Did you know that? Why did you think she come to the well at the time she did? She couldn't hang out with the other women. She was hated. And what did Jesus say? Jesus told his disciples, he said, I must go through Samaria. He had a divine appointment with her. The Spirit has a divine appointment with you. Have you had that meeting yet? Have you accepted the call of Christ by saying, Lord, I know you're Lord, and yes, I need a Savior? Or have you rejected it? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet and bow your heads. No, no piano, no nothing. Heads bowed. If you're here today and you're saved, you know you're saved, are you dead to sin? Are you still dabbling with sin and playing with it? Why? He said we're dead to sin. The only reason you're still dabbling with it is because you want to. If you're here today and you're not saved, what are you waiting for? Why hadn't Jesus been able to save you yet? If you're here today and you've got family that's lost, why well, haven't you shared the love of God with them? Why well, haven't you begged them? Why well, haven't you pleaded with them? Why well, haven't you prayed like never before? God send somebody they will listen to. And dear Heavenly Father, God, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Lord, each one of us here today fall into one or two categories. Either we're headed to heaven or we're headed to hell. God, Jesus on that cross made a way that we did not have to go to hell. So Lord, I pray right now that you give the ones listening here in person and those listening online one more chance, God. Let the Holy Spirit convict them one more time. 
And Lord, let them respond to the Holy Spirit like Paul did and said, Yes, Lord. Let them respond to the Holy Spirit with a, a broken heart and a, and, a, and a broken spirit saying, Yes, Lord, I've tried it everything the other way, but I need you now. Lord, put it on our heart right now for people that need to come to your house, that need to know that Jesus loves them, that yes, Lord, they made a mess of their life. And, and yes, Lord, they're ashamed sometimes because people look down on them. Lord, let us be like Christ with the woman at the well. Let us not be ashamed to go out and, sp and spread the love of Jesus Christ because everybody deserves to hear it. Now, Lord, thank you for the little church by the road and thank you for what you're doing here spiritually physically and emotionally. God, thank you that our little church can be such a blessing to the girls at the, at the girls' ranch who have no parents, they have nobody, God. Let us demonstrate the love of Christ to them. Now, Lord, I thank you again for loving us. Thank you for letting your son die for us, and thank you for saving our souls. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.